Good morning. Good morning. Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Mary and Greg and I are delighted to be with you this morning. We wish you all a blessed Sabbath. We're pleased that you have decided to join us virtually, those of you at home, and, uh, and uh, those of you here in the, in the Sabbath School class uh, to study God's Word through the Sabbath School lesson. Mary, will you pray for God's blessings on this morning's yes, study? Yes, I will. Let's bow our heads, please. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we're so very grateful for another Sabbath morning that you've given us. We want to invite you into our hearts and our minds right now. We ask that you please send your Holy Spirit into each and every one of us, those who are watching online, those of us who are here. Lord, we're all one family right now. We want to worship you by opening your word and letting you speak to us. So we pray that you please answer our prayer and do that, that we may learn some precious lessons that you want us to learn in loving and trusting and obeying you. Please be with our equipment and with Jill, who's managing it, Lord, that it'll all work and that we will be blessed amen. to be a blessing to others today. In Jesus' precious name, amen. 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 Thanks so much, Mary. Well, we are going to sit down and study and discuss and talk about Sabbath School lesson number 12. And the title of this week's lesson is The Call to Stand. And I tell you what, this is a very special lesson. When it comes to <laughs> Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 12 is vital vital for you, particularly as we choose to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, okay? The memory text, verses 10 and 11. And, and by the way, seeing that we are doing verses 10 to 20, we are all going to speak a lot about these <clears throat> verses as we move forward. So I want you to, to uh, realize that there will be a lot of repetition with different explanations. But the memory text, verses 10 and 11. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, says the Apostle Paul to the church of Ephesus, but to you and to me. In other words, Paul provides the secret for victory. So what's the secret for victory? Stand strong. Be strong in the Lord. Then verses 11 says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. This will be unpacked to you in greater detail um, um, as we move forward. Now let's provide a brief, uh, a brief overview of this week's Sabbath School lesson. And I just believe it is important for us to actually understand what is this lesson all about. And so um, our study of Paul's letter to the Ephesians We've seen thus far how the Apostle Paul has integrated together several important and foundational facts about the true gospel. Paul describes how the Lord has restored to unity. Let me make sure that this is right here, otherwise my... my uh, Headset just fell down and pulled my thing down. So Paul describes how the Lord has restored to unity Jews and Gentiles, husbands and wives, children and parents, slaves and masters. Paul shows us how through Christ our lives have been transformed, that in him we are resurrected, we will ascend, and we will be exalted with Christ. And Paul reminds us that God gave us blessings and gifts and that we have been constituted into the church of God united into the Lord. So, thus far, as we've really studied uh, Ephesians, true gospel reflects unity in Christ. It reflects a transformation through Christ. And he tells us that we, have, we were formed into the church of God 
as a witness, as a soldier. Very important. So, do all these facts mean that the history of salvation is over and that there is nothing else for us to do? Not at all. Not at all. In the last chapter of Paul's letter to the Ephesians, specifically Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 20, the apostle reminds the, uh, the Ephesians, and for that matter you and I, that Christians are not simple saved people who are brought together into the fold of Jesus. On the contrary, on the contrary, Paul tells us in, in the epistle that once Christians join the kingdom of the Lord, they take part in defending God's kingdom and promoting it. They become soldiers of Christ, soldiers of the kingdom. Please note, Christians are not soldiers in the same way that soldiers functioned in the Roman Empire during Paul's time, or for that matter, in our military armed forces. Nor are they a militarized rebel militia, as you heard of those fighting with Russia in Ukraine. You see, the Christian's enemy is spiritual, and so is their armor and weapons. It is a cosmic battle they face which started in the heavenly places by the devil and continues here on earth, as the Apostle Paul states in Ephesians 6.12. You got Ephesians 6.12? Jill, let's read it. It says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. We're a different type of soldier. Right. The source of the power and strength of Christ does not reside in their own muscles or armor or weapons or battle skills and strategies. All of that is not good enough to fight principalities and the devil and the demons. Rather, the source of power for you and for me is the Lord, always, 24-7, 365. Christians should fight as our Lord fought, by crushing evil and worldly powers with the power of love and justice that comes from the cross. And yet, the cross they fight with is not theirs. So you are not fighting your cross with the devil. The Lord, you see, is the one who provides the cross to be fought. So it was the Lord who obtained the victory over the powers of evil at the cross. It was the Lord who resurrected and ascended to the heavenly places. It is by virtue of this victory at the cross that the Lord Jesus gives his children his resurrection. You are resurrected because he is resurrected. That he gives us his life and blessings. You have a potential eternal life because he provides that to you and I. His gifts, especially his spiritual gifts and his armor, as we study in Ephesians chapter 6. Coveting Christ's armor. The Christian fights for a battle that Christ has already won. In, in, in writing in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 20, Paul prays for an enhanced vision for believers so that they will be able to see the full real, reality of the great controversy as well as to draw hope from what it reveals to them. So, in this week's Sabbath school study, we are going to focus on two major uh, themes. The first, by joining the church, you and I, Christians, automatically engage in a spiritual battle of cosmic proportion. Neither you nor I have been asked whether you want to be part of it or not, although you and I have the 
opportunity to make that decision. But you become a Christian, you're engaged as a soldier. Secondly, the Christian does not need to worry. For his or her strength and armor comes from the Lord. Thus all a Christian must do is to stand his or her ground in the Lord. I hope that's a good introduction for this week's lesson. Uh, Mary, battle peace speech. Paul concludes Ephesians with a call to battle, and he provides a major speech. Can that's you unpack right. that for us? Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. So today's lesson, Sunday, is the battle speech. And this is Paul's call to a spiritual battle, as Victor was saying, of cosmic proportions. And he's urging believers to take a stand for God and against evil. So what does Paul's battle cry mean to us today as combatants in the great controversy? So we're going to cover verses 10 through 20, and I just want to share some highlights of the verses. And in verses 10 and 11, there are a couple of elements that Victor touched upon. And in verse 10, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his <coughs> might. So this is the overarching exhortation right here. This is where our strength comes from. That's it. From who? Stand strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. So it's not in self-confidence, it's not in our self-sufficiency. It's completely in him. And in verse 11, it begins with an action. What is that? What are the first two words? Put on. That means we must choose to act, right? We have to engage in the activity. We have to be willing to put on this armor and to go into battle, okay? Verse 11 continues with putting on what? The partial armor, the whole armor. Not just part of it, it's the entire thing armor and why is it necessary verse 11 it continues to say that you may be able to stand yeah if we do not have the whole armor we will not be able to stand and we won't be able to stand against what the wiles of the devil the schemes of the devil without the whole armor we are weak and vulnerable and an easy target to take out. We won't be effectual as soldiers standing up for truth and righteousness. So it's extremely important that we're wearing the whole armor of God. Amen. In verse 12, as Victor just read, what is the battle against? The spiritual, spiritual forces against satanic agencies that are supernatural. And our opponent is the adversary of truth and his inspiration is from beneath. You know, it always amazes me that some people, now most of them are, are um, maybe not Christians, but to see the evil around us, yet not acknowledge that there is some supernatural power behind it makes someone very vulnerable. Yes. What does it mean against principalities? It means authorities. It means rulers. He's repeating, at least that's how I understand it, that principalities are rulers in high places, but that are also, it's Satan and his agencies, demons, but that are also working through humans in high places. It could be governments, it could be organizations. Um, non-governmental organizations, but organizations yeah. nonetheless. I, going back to, excellent, because going back to it, um, principality is also what is their operational, you know, what is their, you know, in a, in a company at the goal, so what is their underlying motive? There you, you go. You know, Jesus' motive versus 
Satan's motive. Yeah. Cool. There you go. And Eva? Spirituality is like characteristic of the rule of God. Uh, that's how I understand it. <laughs> God has the principality. God has the rule. That's what Jesus did to Satan when he tempted him uh, in the, uh, during 40 days of his fasting. And he used the armor of God. He used the word of God right. to right. defeat him. Exactly. So, principality, what is principality of God's rule? I, I, can, can, I, can, can I go back? This is a great question, Roy. Great question. Great answer. And we need to understand the principality is an agency. And it is a spiritual agency. What is that spiritual agency? We're talking about demons. We're, talk, we're talking about the devil. We're talking about any individual that comes into the power of the devil and its demons. Yes, Prince thank you. And if I could just add one more thing, because right. I think that's really important. The demons work through people. They can right. work by themselves, but they also work through people. Correct. Correct. Through government, through work, our workplace. So. Byron, I think you had a... You know, yeah. Peter. Yes. Yeah. Did you well, I mean, a good example of that would be Christ with the Pharisees. Right. And Satan was working through them. But in other translations, it says rulers. So those that are in established, authoritative positions, human beings... Influenced by. Influenced by. Exactly. Right. Because even, right. even when it talks in Daniel about when Gabriel went against the prince of Persia, was it really... The king of Persia, he was against, or the demonic influence correct. thereof. That's right. correct. There you go. Mm -hmm. so, Thank you. Yes. Uh, I ask that question because what I understand from history and government classes in school, that the United States was founded as a Christian nation. Right. And over the last 247 years, I've seen where the United States has kind of lost its first love. Kind of reminds me of the Church of Ephesus mm -hmm. or the right. Church of Laodicea. So the United States, it seems like it's in a spiral downward. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying all government officials, some are good, some are not as good as... Like I said, I don't know how the founding fathers would be. <coughs> like Washington and Jefferson and uh, you know, Madison and Rhodes would think about what's going on in the United States today. Yeah, well, we know from right. Bible prophecy, right, the, um, the beast out of the earth was going to be the one that would look like a lamb and then speak like a dragon. So I think we've seen that transition and it's speaking more and more Very like a dragon. Yep. I asked the people where I go to pray to the United States. Amen. Amen. So, uh, I pray for their country too. But Amen. I also Amen. pray for our country. We do need to. Elisa. Yeah. This is a thought that's probably just kind of expounds on and a little bit different than what, what what was stood into the, the lesson, but these statements here in Ephesians are a very powerful statement against evolution. And let me explain. Sure. In the animal kingdom, God has provided for ways of defense, whether it's a turtle in a shell, you know, a snake with venom, whatever it is, plants have defenses, everything has defenses, and evolution looks at the human being and says, where's your defense? You have no defense. God provided our defense Correct. through our ability to choose. And the choice of choosing him and putting on his armor is the ultimate defense over anything that in this wicked world can come against us. Amen. We have Amen. the crowning defense. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, that. you're welcome. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Um, I had had thought of it from that approach, so so thank you for sharing that. Um, yes. Also, we're, we're in the Bible, we're made in God's image, not the image of a monkey or a right. lizard right. or whatever. So. Amen. Evolution. I, I I like to discuss with evolutionists and see what's replacing them. <laughs> yeah. Usually, falls apart their their uh, facts. What well, they call facts, but uh, right. right. And so, with verse thirteen again. I wanted to point out that Paul repeats the take up the whole armor of God. So in this short section of, of chapter 6, twice he's saying, take on the whole armor of God. That's a point he is trying to make. And we can't just read it over like, oh, okay, it's just, yeah, 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 I know. We need to take it to heart. Now, verses 14 to 17 we don't have it up on the screen, 
because we're going to go into it in detail next week. That's where right. um, all the various components of the armor, you right. know, the breastplate, the belt, the shoes, the shield, the helmet, and the sword. We're going to go into that next week. So right. I'm going to skip over that. But verse 18 and 19, once we've put on the armor, right, in verse 18, what are we supposed to do? What do we start off with? Mm -hmm. Praying always, mm -hmm. that is the next key component in this mm -hmm. battle against evil, is praying always with supplication in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit needs to be in our praying. Amen. And Amen. it also says, be watchful, being watchful to this end, right? So what are we supposed to be watchful for? The wiles of the devil. The wiles of the devil, yes. Is there anything else that we should be watchful for? It's at the very end of verse 18. The last four words. Perseverance. Praying for and watchful for all the saints. We need to pray for one another. For one another. And watch out for one another. If I've never been a sh soldier, but I've, I imagine if I was a sh soldier, I'd have to be watching out for my fellow soldiers. Cover their backs, right? Likewise, we need to be praying for one another, helping each other, exhorting each other, encouraging. Yes, Byron. The, the word believe is to stay on Greek, right? And it's talking about the trust that you have in someone, that like a spouse has in someone, or in war, the trust that you have in the soldier next to you to look out, watch your back, and you watch his because your life literally depends on it. Now, if you apply that to this, if we're all soldiers for Christ, we're supposed to have that, if we truly believe, we're supposed to have that same attitude. Amen. Amen. I have to go back to Jesus as example. He prayed, I mean, his key to the successful, to his successful is praying. And he prayed for people, for his disciples, for people the whole world. And he prayed for his strength, you know, for God to strengthen him. And right. the angel constantly and the Holy Spirit constantly being with him because of his praying, his connection with the Father. Exactly. And, and in verse 19, he's saying, and for me. He's saying, pray for me, right? Because he started verse 18, praying always with prayer and supplication. And then he's saying, at the end of verse 18, for all saints and for me. So we need to keep also in mind those in leadership positions that are on the front lines, especially if they're pastors, they're teachers, Bible workers, ministry leaders. We need to pray for one another, especially for them. They're really on the front lines and being attacked yeah. by the enemy yeah. in so many different ways. Sparta, uh, the battle where there's 300 men versus the whole Persian, the Persian army. army. And they guarded themselves with the shield, right? And nobody could get to them. Same thing, what Satan did, he split Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And, you know, Adam could have not eaten the fruit and said, you know what, let me ask God for forgiveness. Or, you know, and their eyes did not open right away till both of them, all, you know, ate the fruit together. So watching out for one another. And as soon as they sinned, they started blaming one another. Yeah. You know, so that's so we that, need to that happens in our church always, that disunity that Satan creates. Exactly. You know. And this is Paul, again, exhorting unity. How many more minutes do I have? Um, mm, well, I'm just going to make a real quick, I, I think we may be coming to the end. But I did want to point out three other battle speeches in the Old Testament, and I'll just read parts of them to you. We may have them up there. The first one is in Deuteronomy um, 20, 1 to 4, and this is where Moses is giving them rules of warfare to the Israelites. And he says, when you go forth to war against your enemy and see horses and chariots and an army larger than your own, you shall not be afraid of them for the Lord your God is with you. Amen. First, he's saying, God is with you, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And we'll jump down to verse 3. And shall say to them, Hear, O Israel, you draw near this day to battle against your army. 
Let not your heart faint. Do not fear or tremble or be in dread of them. For the Lord your God, in verse 4, the Lord your God is he that goes with you to fight for you against your enemies, to give you the victory. So here clearly we see historically who fought for Israel. God fought for them. Absolutely. We're spiritual Israel. Who's going to fight for us? God is. God. Mm -hmm. He will be with us. And as it said in verse 4, he will give you the victory. And my second um, uh, story that I want to bring up is King Hezekiah, when he is and Jerusalem are surrounded by Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, outnumbered. And this is in 2 Chronicles 32, 6 to 8. Then he set military captains over the people, this is King Hezekiah, gathered them together to him in the open square of the city gate and gave them encouragement. And this is what Paul's giving us, encouragement. So here, the king's giving them encouragement. Be strong and courageous, do not be afraid, nor dismayed before the king of Assyria, nor before all the multitude that is with him. For there are more with us than with him. Is that true for us today? Yes. Amen. And then he says, with him is an arm of flesh. That's with the king of Assyria. But with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. Amen. This was one of the greatest prayer. And then in that prayer, Hezekiah involved the wives and the children, and they all came and prayed together. That's right. Amen. And I just want to conclude with... Um, I'm going to have to skip over something else that I wanted to share. But I'm going to conclude with a quote because Paul, this is a battle speech to encourage us in this spiritual battle that we face each and every day. Okay. And so I wanted to share this quote from Sister White, and it's regarding a call to stand in this spiritual battle. And she says, in the Christian warfare life, spiritual life, courage, constancy, and decision are needed. Be strong in the Lord. There she's repeating what is in the Old Testament many times. Be strong in the Lord. Human courage will not suffice. The Christian soldier must be strong in the Lord. God is all sufficient. Not partially, not some, not a little, all sufficient. In the omnipotence of his might, gird on the armor. Here she's bringing on the armor that we studied this week and we'll study more next week. Make use of all the proper means of defense against the enemy. Resist temptation. Cultivate the Christian virtues. Be strong. Yes, be strong. Those who have so many battles to fight must be strong for service. Gain strength and help from the source of all power. If we trust in the Lord, we shall triumph in the warfare against unseen foes. But, we have to pay attention here, if we trust in our own strength, we shall surely meet with defeat. The armor is prepared, put it on and fight bravely for the Lord. And with that, Thanks, we can move on. Mary touched on strength, and strength comes from the Lord. Unpack that for us. Amen. So, good morning, everybody, and happy Sabbath. Um, Monday's lesson is titled, Finding Strength in Christ. And as we read Ephesians 6, 10 through 20, today's lesson, Monday's lesson, is going to focus on the source of the strength in this battle that we're facing against evil as we near the end of time in the great controversy. So, while we're going to also learn about the source of strength, we're also going to learn, and I think we all know this, but it's just affirming our knowledge of this, is we're going to learn why we need this strength, the full armor of God. And as we mentioned, next week's focus will go into detail about the armor itself. I'm going to cover some of it just over just a very broad spectrum, but the detail will be given more next week. So let's begin by reading Ephesians 6, 10 through 13. We've read a couple of verses, but let's just read 10 through 13 nonstop if someone would like to read that for us. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may 
be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Thank you very much, David. So we see here, again, in verse 10, that Paul identifies Christ as the source of our strength, both individually and collectively as a church. Christ is our strength. And the, the Greek word here for Lord, because you could say, well, does he mean Lord Jesus or does he mean God the Father in this instance? In verse 10, the word is kurios, not theos, kurios. And kurios right. is the title given to God the Messiah. Correct. So that's how we know that he's talking about <coughs> Jesus here. And he tells us to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. And as we've touched on, what kind of strength and might are we talking about? Victor touched on this. Are we talking about typical strength, brute strength, as regular warriors have, you know, where they're trained physically strong to withstand one another? Or are we talking a different kind of strength? Different. Different spiritual. kind of strength. This is, we're talking about a spiritual battle. Significant. So that's what we're talking mm -hmm. about here. And the lesson points out that this power is to be exhibited by the church. It's not inherent in believers but is derived. So what's the difference between inherent versus derived? It's, uh, it's through practice. It's through relationship. And, you know, if we are, it's like somebody who's born a millionaire versus somebody who has to earn the million. You that's, see, a great, that's a great analogy. It's something that yeah. if you've been given, or genetically, if you're predisposed to this, okay, that's something that's it's inherent. Okay, and as far as definitions, inherent, existing in someone or something, as a permanent and inseparable element, quality, or attribute. Do we have inherent strength in God? Or is it a choice? We have both, actually, because we're made in the image and likeness of God. Yeah, to we begin with. But we can turn away, which means we, we, we have, have a choice. choice. You use that have God choice. Is strength. If I'm given a choice with the state that I'm born in, because I have an inclination to sin, right? If I'm given the choice, I'm not choosing God, I'm choosing me. Right, yeah. right, and that, that's the difference right there. Inherent is you don't really have a choice. It's built in you. I was born in the fact that I'm like, I am inherently drawn towards God and want to do his will. That'd be one thing, but right. we're actually born the opposite of that. That's right. Versus derived, it's received, obtained or arising from a particular source. Well, who's the source? We just, Paul identified the source. Exactly. Yeah. You, know, you know, the beauty about, mm -hmm. uh, and this is a very good question because we, we struggle with that as Christians. Mm -hmm. the, the, the thing about it is that you, yeah, you and I inherently have a, a sense to go with God. But because of sin, because of sin, we tend to go with the inheritance that we acquired from Adam and Eve. And it, it is that fight, that daily fight, that you and I are going to go through every day. What do I do now? If we weren't so focused on ourselves, we would be able to cast out demons. I have read um, papers by Adventist ministers that have been published, even in our church, where if you lose your self and right. you're all through Jesus, they're casting out demons. Right, amen. That's exactly right. Yeah. And and I, think, I think that's, I'm sorry, I think that's part of the dying daily. That's it. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have to die right. daily and we yeah. need to ask for that rebaptism of the Holy Spirit every day because otherwise our natural inclination to right. go against God and for ourselves Right. will take over. And I think that's, that's a great point because Jesus even said, if we had faith, in other words, faith in him, not in ourselves, the size of a mustard seed, we could move mountains. So it goes right to what you're saying. So thank you for bringing that up. Design for ourselves, that process, is that metaphorically shown in the being on the armor of God? I mean, that's kind of what that process is, right? <laughs> to being in Christ. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Roy, did you want to say something? Yeah, King David was a pretty classic example. I mean, he was raised by Jesse and righteous 
homes have learned about the ways of God and they went off the rails for a long time and after he became king and he came back to the end. And let's continue with this because the strength and might come from our Lord Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. But we have to remember one thing too. Where does all this power flow from? Who did Christ tap into for his strength? The Father. God. The Father. So let's read mm -hmm. Ephesians 3, 14 through 17. If someone Amen. could read that. Mm -hmm. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, yes. from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. Yes, thank you very much. So again, Paul is saying, he bows his knees to the Father because he recognizes, he knows that Jesus tapped into the Father. That's why Jesus was praying. He wasn't praying to himself or to anybody else. He was praying to the Father and it was by the Father and the, the Holy Spirit that he gained that strength. Sure. You know, we just have to surround and make, make it in our mind that the God's will takes precedence. So thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus said, Father, if it's your will, remove this cup. But, you know, your will be done. Well, how does a soldier win a battle, even though it's a losing battle? Because he or she knows that whatever the commander's will is, I have to follow it to the end. And guess what? In God's kingdom, all the murders that die are the ones God is still waiting for. So that number is completed in Christ's second coming. So it's not about winning the battle that way, but it's about the loyalty to the will of God. Exactly. Because we're going to learn, and I'll make a statement about it in today's lesson, but we're going to learn in more detail what that means next week. When we read Ephesians 6, 14 <coughs> through 18, I'm going to read this real quickly here. And I just want to make a, a point about this because it has to do with the strength that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Stand therefore girding, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the sword which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance supplication for the saints. So this full armor of God, what are, we're not going to talk about all the symbolism, but what are the attributes of this strength that we just went through, that we just read? Think about it. The attributes are <coughs> truth, righteousness, Peace, love, faith, love, the word of God, prayerful perseverance, Absolutely. and supplication in the spirit. Amen. So here what this is telling us is the whole mm. Godhead is engaged Amen. in equipping and strengthening us for what we need in this spiritual battle. So then it begs the question again, okay, so why do we need this strength and armor of God? Well, the text gives us the answers to that, which is nice. And we've, we've touched on the first one, and that is in verse uh, 13. It's so that we can withstand the wiles, the deceptions, the temptations, the accusations that will be unleashed against us by the devil, his demons, and who they work through. So we need to keep in mind that this description, while it's symbolic, it is literal. And it's literal in terms that the great controversy and the spiritual battle that we're in, we're nearing the close of that time. And so it's really going to be unleashed and we have to be prepared with this. But the second reason that we have to, um, that we need God's strength and armor is verse 19 through 20. If someone could please read that for us. And for me that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, 
that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. The commandment of Jesus. Amen. That's so important there because we need God's strength, not only to withstand the devil and the wiles of the devil, but we need his strength and protection so that we may open our mouths boldly. Think of when persecution comes, we haven't experienced it. Maybe some of you have who have lived in different countries or, or ministered. You know and understand what persecution can be like. We have no clue what it's like. And to be able to open our mouths boldly, we won't be able to do that unless we have the full armor of God and that we take, as you had mentioned, my sister. The full armor of God it has to include kindness and compassion. And if you just look Absolutely. at the politics of our day, you can see where they're lacking. That's so true. And you brought up a point, and, and I'm going to touch on that precisely because it goes right there with that point. So we have to open our mouths boldly. And how would we be able to do that when people... People ridicule the Seventh-day Adventist church right now as far as, oh, you guys are legalists, you guys keep the Sabbath. Look, 99.5% don't keep Saturday, they keep Sunday, you guys are legalists, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But that's not with persecution. That's just verbal slander at, 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 a, yeah, at a light instance. Does this mean speaking boldly in our own worldly and human ways? In other words, screaming at each other in anger? trying to win and argue a debate? Does that mean that? Or like shouting boastfully in, in our own self-righteousness? We're Adventists. We have the truth. You guys are fools. You guys don't know what you're doing. You guys don't study your Bible. No, that's not what that means. So in Letters and Manuscripts 101 from 1899, paragraph 4, Ellen White, I think, really encapsulates what this means. And I'm going to go ahead and read this. Get hold of God, and God will get hold of you. Reach the people through Christ. You cannot reach them through yourself. Reach them through the Spirit of God. Call upon, God calls upon us to put on the armor. We don't want Saul's armor, but the whole armor of God. Once we do that, then, she says, we can go forth to the work with hearts full of Christ-like tenderness, compassion, and love. That's how we're supposed to speak boldly and go forth. Greg, if I may, uh, and, and this, sorry, Roy, uh, if I may, and, and this, and this is, is vital. When, when the Bible tells me that I've got to speak, and I've got to speak with, what does the Bible really say? That I've got to be that which I should speak. Most of the problem in the Christian world is that we're too good at saying what we should be to others. But when we become that which God wants us to be, and the armor of God, when, when we talk about the armor of God, we really are saying we must be in Jesus because the armor of God is really Jesus in me. Amen. When I am in Jesus, there's very little I've got to say. Right, because our actions, our hearts will be full with Christ like tenderness, and compassion, and love, compassion, and, and love. tenderness, exactly. being righteous, being truthful, being honest. That's how we witness. Right. We don't want to fit. The armor, not like loose fitting or this, because armor is only effective when it's fit. So what Victor always says, die to the cross. Exactly. So remove our old clothing, because Saul's armor was not fitting on David. It was a good armor, but it wasn't fit. Right. And no armor is effective unless there's fit. So unless we kill, you know, die to the ourselves, be naked. So it starts with repentance. It had to be starting with repentance, and that's that's right. really the Holy Spirit working with yeah. us. Question, what's the difference between prayer and supplication? I'm going to see if I can. Is there a difference? Okay. Uh, I believe that there is from what I looked at. Prayer is we can be praying, but supp suppl supplication is pouring yourself out. We could be praying lightly. That's exactly right. And I sometimes well, catch myself doing that almost in vain repetition, not as far as Catholicism rosary, but as far as praying kind of the same thing. 
but with supplication, really pouring yourself out, really giving ourselves to God. Um, another definition, we actually covered this in the Bible study last night in um, Philippians. Um, prayer is a general prayer and having a prayerful life. Supplication was specific things you're praying for as well. So in other words, you're praying for God to intervene into an individual or a situation. And, and Jesus showed that. Jesus' life was a life of prayer and supplication. Supplication when he really poured his heart to God and said, God, take this cup away from Amen. me. God, it is so terrible. How yeah. can I handle this without you? Yeah. Supplication means, yes. Dad, I cannot live without you. Right. Really Prayer says, Dad, I want to thank you for what you give me every day. Yes. Very that, good question. Did you? No, it's just adding to what you were saying, speaking boldly that Paul wants us to be, right? I live in a Muslim country, 90% of Muslim, 99% of Muslim country. So I read this house from Muslim Hajja, who is like being pilgrimed many times. And he told me, don't put your Bible on your bookshelf and take out the Jesus pictures from that wall. And I told him, look, I rent this house. I have right to do anything. You pray from like 24 seven. So you put your tape on while people are sleeping at three o'clock in the morning, waking up next to my bedroom. I mean, that's disturbing. You use my terrace to pray with your Muslim ladies every day. I don't say anything. I just, very quickly, I know you're out of time. Yes. I have a good example of the armor of God and Christ portrayed in himself. And John said, and when he tells the temple guards, the Pharisees tell the temple guards to go arrest Jesus. This is like going manhandle, right? And they come back and they say, why did you not bring him? In verse 45, the officers answered, never has a man spoken the way this man speaks. And the Pharisees said, answered, or then answered them, you have not also been led astray, have you? In other words, when you have the full armor of God, when you're projecting, when God is working through you to that <coughs> level, it affects everything around you. Yes, it does. And the result can be dead, like Jesus died on the cross for all of us, but that means nothing. Well, my time is, is up for uh, Monday's so, lesson. So. You, you know, I keep on saying every year, Sabbath school should be three hours. <laughs> <laughs> And I can tell you, you would benefit greatly, and so would I, and so would everybody else. Yep. But I want to thank you, Greg. Sure. Strength. Where does the strength come from then? Jesus. Jesus in you, portrayed in that armor. Perfect. You should have gotten um, a, um, hand out. an end out. I provided you an end out. I, I really did that for two reasons. One side really is part of... Uh, might use the presentation. The other side is a conclusion, uh, a final thoughts for the lesson. And because I don't know how much time we're going to have, I wanted you to have something that you, took, you could take home. So Tuesday's lesson, Tuesday's lesson of the Sabbath school lesson, really talks about great controversy in Paul's letters. And by the way, Paul's letters are full of great controversies. And whether it is Romans or Corinthians or Thessalonians, or whether it is Ephesians or Philippians, Paul is really talking about a armor of God and an army of God facing a great controversy daily. That's really what he does. But I want to today, I want to really concentrate on two, uh, two aspects of, of the lesson here. First, Paul uses military language as one of his major ways to help us understand the gospel. And we're going to unpack that for you. And secondly, that Paul portrays the church as a well-equipped army. And he brings together elements of the cosmic conflict that has already used throughout his letter for us to understand the journey. Is, is that good? So let's handle the first aspect first. So... Paul uses military language as one of his major ways to help us understand the gospel. So here's some examples, and I'm going to give you sequential. We're going to look at uh, a war, a, a, uh, a global world, uh, a, uh, a universal war that was won. 
We're going to see how the Lord, as he wins this war, is crowned king, ruler. He's, and then we're going to see how upon he wins the war, he begins to recruit his people to form an army for him. So let's look at that. Colossians chapter 2, verses 15. What does it say? Anybody wants to read that for me? Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Who did, who did that? Jesus. Jesus. So Jesus does what? He disarmed the principalities. We've been talking all about that. So who did he fight? The devil, the demons, the spirits of evil, and those that aligned with them. And what happened? He, he made a public them. spectacle of them. Where? At the cross. That war was won at the cross, at Calvary, when he breathed his last breath and said, It is done. It is finished. And he, what does that mean? Triumphing over them in it. All right. Therefore, Paul explains that the exalted Christ now works out the results of the victory from his position as exalted Lord and King. Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 to 11. Philippians 2, 9 to 11. Would somebody read that for me? Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, and those in heaven and those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Isn't this military language? You go to war, you win the war. When you win the war, what happens? You bow down to the king. You, 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 you are crowned king. You own. You rule. It is yours. And what, in this particular case, what's the beauty? Is that God the Father sits Christ next to him in his own throne and says, You are co regent, you king. You're all powerful. It is yours. Because he revealed the Father's love. Amen and won the great controversy, not by power, but by love. By love. Absolutely right. So, go ahead. Go ahead. So when we approach other people, maybe you should be with the interest in them. Exactly. Rather than the interest in our package of information. Exactly. Perfectly stated. It was as good yet to them. Perfect. Yeah. The, 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 the six things God hated and seven yeah. is the abomination. What's the number one? Proud look. Exactly. I'm, I'm exactly. Very approachable to, right. to people. I'm not saying look approachable. Right. Guess what? I'm ineffective exactly. with the gospel. It, 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 you know, I love your statement so much. So I'm going to add to that, if I may. You know, Christ tells me that my conversion is sin in my humility. Many times, the problem with us is that we, we get so like a peacock <laughs> with all the knowledge that we've got that we show our beauty ra rather than our humility Amen. at the cross. Humility and love reigned. Go ahead. And the victory at the cross exactly. is what then forced the devil and the angels onto earth. Amen. We tend to think it back at Eden, but it was at the cross at the that cross. then was struck. Exactly. So, two pieces that we, we've learned. So, what did Christ do for us? Well, he, won, he wins the war. The war for my salvation. The war for my right to be a son of God. <laughs> Secondly, the father recognizes that he is 
Corrigent, king of the universe. Now what does he do? So, so now, as conqueror and king, Jesus Christ recruits his followers. And he prepares them to be combatants in the cosmic war. And so Christ leads the armies of light toward a grand day of victory. And here's how the Apostle Paul paints it. 1 Corinthians, we're going to read uh, chapter 15, and then we're going to read verses 54, and then 56 to 58. Can somebody read that for me? So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Amen! I want you to memorize that particular verse, verse 58. What is verse 58 says? I'm going to recruit you to be part of my army. And I can assure you today that you will be successful. You will be victorious. You will win the battle. And why? Because you are going to be fitted with me and my character. And you will be doing my will. Mm -hmm. Ah, it's beautiful. Isn't that war? When the soldiers are recruited, what do they look to? Fulfill a promise, a goal. And that is important. And as part of the army of God, army of Christ, you and I need to be committed to victory. All right. So that was part of, of this lesson. That's really part of the great controversy. And I wanted you to, be, uh, to see that. So when we study and read Ephesians, we find a tightly woven narrative structure that is driven by the pattern of divine warfare. Ephesians is very much that way. By the way, Ephesians is really a mirror of revelation in many respects. Oh, I just wish I had the time to be able to spend it with you and to open Revelations and Ephesians and just to go through it. But Ephesians is very much a parallel, a mirror of revelation. Okay, so here... Paul portrays the church as a well-equipped army, and he brings together elements. We're talking about elements of the cosmic conflict that he has already used, used throughout the ladder. So let's, uh, let's look at that. And if uh, I want to be timed, it's now, I've got about three or four minutes uh, in reality. So I've given you, um, I've, I've given you a... Um, um, the handout. The handout. An handout. And in that end out, all the verses are there. So I'm going to touch the elements, I hope, and I'm going to quote the verse uh, for those of you online. Uh, but I may not be able to read the verse because I want you to pay attention. Here's the elements. And I think it is very important. The first element, God empowers believers with immense power. By the way, we read that in chapter 6, verses uh, 10 and 11. Okay, but Ephesians chapter 1 verses 18 to 20 uh, uh, tells us that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of, uh, of the glory of his inheritance uh, in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us, who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which God worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead, and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. God empowers you as a soldier. Secondly, Christ's victory and exaltation over the powers of evil and demons are set, set us free and has given us the assurance that we can also be victorious in Christ. In Christ, you as a soldier, because he was victorious, you will be victorious. And by the way, we are victorious in Christ. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 20, 23, very quickly. 
which God worked. This is what Paul says. Which God worked in Christ, where he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principalities and powers and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his fit feet and gave him to be add over all things to the church, which is the body, the fullness of him who fills. Christ is victorious. As a soldier with Christ, you will be victorious. The third element, believers are a resurrected army. Ooh, I want you to pay attention. You see, you've got to die with Christ at the cross in order to be resurrected in Christ. In order for you to be a soldier of Christ, you've got to be resurrected in Christ. So, it is just, b believers are a resurrected army. Empowered and able, and able by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to fight against the principalities of doom. We spoke about those today here. The devil and the demons. I'm not going to read the verse. You've got the verse you can read. Consequently, the church, the church's role, by the way, the church is the army. The church's role, Christ's army here on earth, is to reveal to the powers of evil the coming soon. Ephesians 3.10 says, To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers of the heavenly places. So, what do you have to do as a soldier? Enlist. You've got to enlist. And what's your, what's your task? What's your assignment? What you've got to do? Reveal to the powers of evil they're coming, they, they, they coming doom. Reveal to the powers of evil they coming doom. And the best way to do it is by your life not by your word. Please note, to become an effective and efficient soldier in Christ's army, Paul tells us that believers are asked to put on the gasp, the gospel clothing. The gospel clothing. I like this definition. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 21 to 24. I'm going to end with this. If, uh, Paul says, If indeed you have heard Christ and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that you put on the new man, which is created according to God into righteousness and holiness. You've got to die for Christ. The old man needs to die. As Christ has been resurrected and you now live in Christ, you're a new man. That's your new clothing. Amen. All right. So now move, let's move to uh, Wednesday. Mary, <clears throat> explain uh, the significance of standing on the battlefield. So in this passage, I don't know how many of you noticed, how many times is the word stand mentioned? Okay, very good, Byron. You get a happy face and a star today. <laughs> three times. And we're going to read those three. And again, I know we're going over these verses, but it's just so important to really cement this in our minds. And we're going to see the, um, the lexicon's uh, explanation of each of the words stand what they really mean. So in verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand that standing is one who is in the midst of a fight and holds his position against the foe while fighting. That's what that word stand means. And this is the same word that was used in Exodus 14, 13, where Moses said to the people, fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord. So this is a stance of one who is holding a position while fighting. In verse 13, it says, Therefore take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, 
to stand. Now this is in the Greek a different word and this means to stand of one who vanquishes his adversary and holds the ground after the battle is won. So you are standing now to hold the ground. And then in verse 14, it says, Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. This word stand is a metaphorical definition, and it's to stand ready or prepared. And note that according to this verse, you can stand only after you've put on the armor, because he says, Stand therefore having, because you've already put on the armor, you can stand ready and prepared. So there are, in this passage, various purposes for standing. The first is you stand against a foe while fighting. Second is you stand as one who holds the ground after the battle is won, and one uh, sorry, number three is to stand ready and prepared on guard. And the Sabbath school lesson, if you read it, it points out that in ancient battles, okay, not nowadays because now our battles are so different with <laughs> missiles and bombs that can be flown over thousands of miles. So, but in ancient times, three successive actions had to occur in order for an army to be victorious. The first one is they had, to, they had to actually meet their foe, okay? They had to get close to the enemy. The second is they had to attack and stand their ground in hand-to-hand -hand combat. And lastly, the third point to be a victorious army is they had to beat back the enemy. So the key moment of the ancient battle was the second of these three actions. When the two opposing armies came crashing together on the battlefield, standing firm at this strategic moment was the great challenge. Each side seeking momentum for the push. They're fighting hand in hand. So we'll get into this close combat for the Christian in Thursday's lesson, so I don't want to go into detail now. But the important thing to notice in this standing, stand, 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 and all three of those, is this is no relaxed stance. Okay, So as Christians, we can't just be relaxed and in this um, unaware situation stance. To stand, then, is to be vigorously engaged in battle, employing every weapon of the armor of God in close order combat. It's a point obvious from the military imagery that Paul is using earlier in his exhortation. And he brings this up in Philippians 2, where he's using this military imagery where he says, standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. And so, why do you think this idea of standing is so important to us, especially today? Yes, Byron. I've seen enough movies, or even in the Bible, the moment you turn and run, you expose yourself. The moment you expose yourself, you're a goner. You're easy prey, and all that armor doesn't help you when your back is facing that them. person. Exactly. So the Sanadis do ready, put the armor of God, you know, so prepare for us now to be spiritual warfare with the devil. Mm -hmm. We have to know the word of God. We have to consume the word of God every day inside the prayer for Be stamped. Amen. All the time. Amen. Okay, Danielle. So if we are always prepared for battle, we are aware, spiritually aware. Otherwise, we are not spiritually aware. If you're not prepared for battle, you're just not spiritually aware? Yeah. <coughs> no, there is no relaxed time. There is no, I'm going to go on my Christian vacation, I'm going to lounge around and stuff like that, because the moment you get laxed, as a moment, the enemy is like, where can I penetrate? Exactly. 
This is a battle. Each and every day, Walter, and then we'll go with David. Uh, <clears throat> for me to be a stand is to be reading the Bible, yeah. okay. to be talking to God in my prayer, and at the same time, to be preaching to the people to let know about the salvation. Um, to stand is a different situation like when you are marching uh, as a soldier. Because here, when you stand, you gotta put all your all your uh, your power in in, com uh, in combat. Of course, in, in uh, as a as a Christian, it's different. You you come with the uh, Holy Spirit power to 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 get strong. But how I said to to be uh, to be a standard, we must we must pray, we must read the Bible, and we must preach the gospel. Amen. Amen. David, did you want well, to we are just say, you know, that stand, like you said, it's ready, set, go. Yeah. That's really the stand, you know, ready, set, and go. So basically, when we stand, guess what? We have to use our core muscles. We have to use every part of our human nature to stand properly. But when we <coughs> sit down, rest, or sleep, we have no control over things. But here, we actually have to choose to stand properly Thank so you. that we are always ready, set, go. And that's what Christian life is, ready, set, go. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm running out of time. I'm sorry. We'll go with Leah. Okay. Um, I'm not a fan of boxing, but what I've seen is that when there's two adversaries that are hitting each other, trying to find the, the soft spots, the, uh, um, as soon as uh, another try to stay on their ground, because the moment they go down on the ground, what happens? They start counting you out. Mm -hmm. And the longer you stay down, the harder it is to get up. Yep. So that's what I saw in, in a lot of things, including that the sport is that it's very important to stay the ground. But even if you fall down, don't stay there that long. Get up. There you go. Thank you for bringing that. Thank you, everyone, for your participation. I, I just want to end with um, another quote. This is from Testimonies for the Church about standing our ground as we've been focusing on today. And Sister White says, in the final victory, so we're in those final days, we know that Christ is coming soon. Amen. So this Amen. is, we're getting into the end of the war. The end of the battle is, is happening right now. It says, in the final victory, God will have no use for those persons who are nowhere to be found in time of peril and danger when the strength, courage, and influence of all are required to make a charge upon the enemy. I know that's, that's hard to read, but I needed it, and I thought, well, maybe you guys could appreciate it as well. And she continues, those who stand like faithful soldiers to battle against wrong and to vindicate the right warring against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places, will each receive the commendation from the master. So if we stand like faithful soldiers to the battle, we will receive the commendation from the master, right. Jesus. Mm -hmm. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. And I will end there. And Thanks we can so go much, on Mary. Thursday. Thank you. Greg, the universal war is won. Right. But the skirmishes are on. Exactly. So we keep on wrestling. Right. Like you said, Victor, the, the war has been won, but the battles keep going. Right. On. Talk and to us so about Thursday's it. lesson is titled Wrestling Against Evil Powers. And we're going to get specifically into the wrestling aspect of it. But throughout Ephesians, Paul uses a variety of titles for the evil spiritual powers, such as in Ephesians 1.21, every name named. In Ephesians 3.10, uses the rulers, the authorities. In Ephesians 6.12, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So why do you think Paul does this? Why do you think he gives different titles or descriptions of evil? 
show the different levels and aspects of it. In other words, how human agencies can actually influence driven by evil, how literally the devil himself or minions are influencing people, etc. So it's a multi-level battle. Right, and I think it's a way of saying, like, when we look at Bible prophecy, at time, times, and half the time, 1,260 days, 42 months, it's saying the same thing, just a different way. Like you said, look at different layers of it. And I think that's what Paul is doing is it doesn't matter the names of how evil is described. The source of evil is still the same. The source is still the devil. Exactly. And all sources are subjugated to God. And we have to remember that God is in control, but God also will let evil in all its names, its disguises, its manners of operation to play out in the spiritual battle that we're involved in. And we know that in any human battle, it doesn't make for good strategy to underestimate your opponent, right? And that's why specifically Paul warns us in Ephesians 6.12, we do not struggle or wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So he's not talking about a spiritual battle whereby we're wrestling with flesh and blood, as we know. We've been discussing that today throughout the lesson. It's a battle against the hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. And the term, the Greek term for wrestle or struggle is Pale. Mm -hmm. And Pale means a contest between two in which each endeavor to throw each other and which is decided when the victor is able to prostrate the antagonist, obviously the opponent, to hold him down with his hand upon yep. his neck. That's right. You're talking about mm -hmm. submission. That's exactly Total right. submission. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And have any of you wrestled before? Now, for the women, of course, I don't think they have women's wrestling <laughs> yet. Yet. <laughs> but for you men, any wrestlers? If Scott was here, Scott's kind of built like a wrestler, you know. He was a wrestler. Well, I'll tell you one thing. I did some wrestling. And when you're wrestling, and the metaphor here I think is perfect using wrestle versus another metaphor. Because in wrestling, every single muscle in your body and everything in your thought is going into that moment. You can't relax your stomach, you can't relax your back, your arms, your shoulders, your head, your neck, your hands. Every aspect of your body is engaged. Yes. And if you right. slacken in one area, your opponent will take advantage of that and put you into submission. Right. It is exhausting. If you wrestle with someone I guarantee for two minutes, just two minutes, That's exactly right. you will be shaking in your muscles unless you're conditioned for that. That's the spiritual bout. That's what it's akin to as far as our spiritual battle. If we let our guards down, the enemy knows Byron's weakness. He knows my weakness. He knows Mary's weakness. Every single one of us, Amen. he knows what can distract us. Yes. Because I remember the first time I went to do the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and I threw up because I was not fit. The fitting is, after that I said, this is not for me. I can't do it. It's so dangerous, you know. But that's, that's, that's the way we have to look at the spiritual battle. Absolutely. It's dangerous because our life depends on it. Right. Because and it's throw up. physical and it's mental. And so right. that's, it can be exhausting. And I know in, in spiritual battles that we, we all face, and if we haven't faced them, we will face them. And some go through more spiritual battle, more extreme spiritual battle than others. But I think it also depends upon, are we putting on the armor of God, number Amen. one. Amen. Number two, are we so involved in the secular world, in what we watch, what we listen to, what we participate in, where we're opening the doors to spiritual battles and, war and warfare. So we have to really be aware of that and what's going on. And even though we may currently be going through some spiritual battles and wrestling with the, the, um, the sources mm -hmm. of evil, yep. we don't need to be discouraged. Yep. Amen. Yep. 
We talked about this earlier. The good news is, is that one, we must be alert and we must be prepared against the forces of evil, but we don't need to be daunted by them. We don't need to be afraid and overcome by it. Why? Because as Victor had said before, the Lord's, all, he's already won the war. So now we are just in these battles. But God has given us, from God the Father, he's given us the heavenly tools, the armor of God, through Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. He's given us the best weaponry, the finest weaponry, mm -hmm. not only known to man, but known to all creation. It's not just to us, it's to all creation. Amen. His armor, the armor of God. Greg, why are we fighting this battle? As Christians, what would be the other reason to fight this battle? Because we already know Jesus. Are we fighting for other people? Because love God by loving your neighbor is that yeah I, I think it's it's both I mean we God says we have to work out our own salvation and that means we're we individually are going to be responsible for the choices that we make but also those choices that we make manifest themselves to those around us and so I think that that's a real good point it's really dual I think in that case and Ellen White says something here and I'm just going to conclude with this because um, I know that we've we've gone over this in, in quite detail um, and we have to leave some for next week's lesson as well. <laughs> but Ellen White, I think, really encapsulates this very well. In Signs of the Times, and this was going back December 5th, 1895, <laughs> and she says, God has furnished everyone with a full armor, but we are under the necessity of putting it on. Amen. It's our <laughs> choice. God's given it to us. And then she continued to say, bear with me one second, for God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves. This whole battle, this whole spiritual battle can seem daunting. Like the Lord is saying, and like she's reemphasizing here, wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another. Mm. That's part of the the blessing of coming to church is being with brothers and sisters who are like-minded that can help us each in whatever struggle we're going against and facing. But God gives us the tools. He's already won the battle for us. So now we just have to step in. We have to fight the war, um, fight the battles that are going on, but put on the whole armor of God. Thank you. Greg and Mary, it's always a delight to co-teach with both of you. Likewise. Likewise. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Oh, <coughs> Ouch. <coughs> Excuse me. This putting on. Right. It, it's so Roman. <laughs> and it's so much the armor stuff. But in our prayers, we ask God if He can put His love in our hearts. Amen. So that. Today, we speak love unconsciously, act love unconsciously. It's His love. Can, and can we imagine what Christ went through in His teenage years and in His twenties, constantly harassed, bullied, having all kinds of thrusts put to Him. And the armor was God's love. Amen. Yes. Yeah. Amen. I, I really appreciate that comment. Paul writing to Hebrews and talking on behalf of the Lord says, I will remove your heart and place a new heart in its place. Amen. That new heart is all about God's love, God's grace. God's graciousness and his love for mankind. After all, you and I will only be in heaven if we love God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our strength, and our neighbor as ourselves, including those we think are enemies. Amen. That's the bottom line. Okay. I just wanted to share that sometimes our battles are with culture. 
uh, I came from a uh, Hispanic culture, and when, in Mexico, when somebody says, how are you, they actually stop and listen to the answer. And when I came here, people say, how are you? And I said, I don't even know, they want to know how I am. And I would start saying it, and they would just walk away. I thought they wanted to know how I am. Yeah. And so I, mean, I couldn't understand that concept. But last week, we were at this restaurant, and this couple was leaving, and they happened to be at the exit. And he comes to church quite often, but I noticed his wife didn't come for a while. And instead of saying, how are you? I don't know why, it must have been the Holy Spirit that said, this was came out of my mouth. I said, how are you feeling? Oh, my mommy did I get an answer. Yes. She stopped and started telling me about all the surgeries she had, about the pain she was in. The whole restaurant could hear it. And at church, I hadn't even talked to her. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm just listening. I said, I didn't realize it. Yes. I had no idea. And she seemed so pleased that somebody actually asked her yes. how she was feeling. Right. Because a lot of times people don't come to church because they don't want to Right. And Lydia, quite frankly, how are you? is a greeting. How do you feel is a question. All right. Let's, let's now, let's now summarize what we did today. Let's summarize what we did today. Some final thoughts. By the way, you should have had that sort of a document. And I want you to retain that because I really believe that verses 10 to 20 of chapter 6 speak to those two things. First, it tells me, Victor, be ready for the battle. And you've got to be ready in Christ. And then secondly says, now follow those principles. There are some principles you need to follow. So let's go through that. Paul appeals to us as soldiers of Christ to be ready for the battle. He tells us to find the power we need in solidarity with our Lord Jesus Christ. Where does my power come from as a soldier? Jesus. He asks us, Paul asks us to engage the powers of God's strength. Whose strength is powerful? Only Christ's strength. He asks us to stand unified and firm by being equipped with God's good gifts of truth, righteousness, gospel, peace, faith, victory, and especially the Holy Spirit. By the way, next week, and I invite you to come, we will handle those individually. And he asks us to, uh, that we do so through constant meditation and prayer. The army of God is God's church. You and I are a bunch of bricks. A bunch of bricks put together to be the church. And it is the Holy Spirit that joins us together as brick by brick by brick. And quite, quite frankly, you and I can only be a church standing together as a army when we love each other, when we tolerate each other. And we can only do this in God's power, the church of Christ. Now, here's what uh, the Apostle Paul says. But in this passage of Scripture, Paul also provides important principles to live by. So, as a church, as a army, what are the principles to live by? He tells us to trust in the Lord rather than in our own spiritual power to rescue Satan's captives. What is your job and my job? Is to proclaim and to live Christ's love in us so we can rescue people. So people say, Victor, you're so strange, you're so different. Why are you so different? Do you have anybody asking you that question? If you don't, you ask the question, Lord, why aren't they asking me, why am I not different? They need to ask you, why are you different? Because that distinguishes you from anything else. Okay. So another important principle of life. Paul tells us to acknowledge the need for and embrace God's provisions for the battle. He is the provider. Not us. He is the provider. God appeals to us to trust in the complete victory of Christ. We need to wear the helmet of victory all the time. You know, if every, every war was already known before the battle began, and if the soldiers knew that they were going to be victorious, how on earth do you think they would fight? 
with all energy and glory. I mean, it would be a happy army. Why? Because they knew the result. Victory. How are you battling the skirmishes you face? And then it says, he asked us to request and fully rely on the presence of the Holy Spirit. We need to trust in the power of the Spirit to convey, to interpret, and to expand our requests on behalf of the oppressed. Our brother here in front twice has mentioned love. If you and I cannot fight with and for love, you're not part of that army. That's the bottom line. The Apostle Paul is telling us to put on Christ's every day. Romans chapter 3, verse 13, verses 11. Um, you probably have that there. Romans 13, 11 tells us, do this. Knowing the time. What? The Apostle Paul couldn't be talking to anybody else better than to you and to me today. He says, do this knowing the time. So what time are we on? Knowing the time. That now it is high time to awake out of our slip, sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than we first believed. Mm -hmm. And I want to finish with 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 8, which says, But let us, what of the day, be sober. There's such, in Scripture, there's such a big difference between those of the night and those of the day, what you do at night and what you do at day. And it says here, um, but let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. I want to thank you. I want to thank you for your participation, for being here, and I want to thank you for your commitment to be a soldier for God. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for your amazing grace. Lord, I want to thank you because the war has been won. And Lord, in this journey until you come for us to celebrate total victory at your second coming, in this journey, you want us to be part of your church. You want us to be soldiers for you. You want us to fight with love and compassion. You want us to be a light shining for you. Lord, as we march in unity, this church, you want us to walk in love, walk in truth, walk in wisdom in you. And Father, we want to do just that. Oh, Lord, help us die for self. Take our will and mold it into yours so that the life we live is no longer ours but yours. And, Father, use us as a beacon of light for our homes, the, work we, the places we work in, and our community. And may the Laguna Niguel Seventh-day Adventist Church be a beacon of light for your glory around the Laguna Niguel Hills. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Have a wonderful day. God bless Happy you. Happy Sabbath. Thank you. Happy, Happy Sabbath. Sabbath.